Okay, we're back with uh, part two of the Flaming Pit Show. I have my call-in guest calling in from Hotlanta, Miss Desiree Lee. Are you there? I am. I am. How's it going down there? I know it's hot. <laughs> <laughs> and humid. <laughs> it is extremely humid. It's like, thank God it's finally some sunshine because it's been raining and raining and raining. But, yeah, it's hot. <laughs> oh, my goodness. We got a little rain here, so we cool down a little bit. But I am so glad to uh, be able to jump into your busy schedule and uh, take a few minutes for you to holler at me here in Flint Town. So I'm looking at... Um, some of your bio and it seemed like you've done a whole lot of stuff so let's talk about I see you're a youth motivator and motivational speaker but the main thing you have on here is that you're an ex-felon so let's talk about what was going on with that yeah definitely um, I am a convicted felon of 11 counts of armed robbery and 5 counts of aggravated assault and though um, some will think, you know, well, what is a girl like you doing with so many uh, counts of armed robbery on your crime? And I can't believe that you're a convicted felon. When I tell people they don't believe it unless I show my mugshot <laughs> yeah. and go through all those different things. Uh -huh. um, but what's awesome about it is it's how, how do I put it, how God can take your broken pieces and make them into your masterpieces mm -hmm. or how God can take your mess and make it into your message or how whatever you might be going through it might not be a criminal record it might be a different situation or how how you can literally take that and make that your mission and it's like you know i'm not happy that i'm a convicted felon but at the same time you know maybe i went through this and went through this journey to prevent other people from going or experience what i experienced so yeah i am a convicted felon and yeah. So it, I'm it, not proud of it, but, you know, like it's, say, it's because of decisions that I made. You yeah. Know? It's one of those things, like you say, you went through it to get to another point in your life, and now you can help other people not make the same mistake or choice. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So now, um, as a motivational speaker, tell me what kind of events have you spoken at that would... Um, you know, encourage people to, like, get on the straight and narrow? Um, I've spoken at various events. It's, this is my, my, my whole thing, right? And um, I'll let you know specifically what places, um, you know, that I had the opportunity to share my story at. But um, I don't care if it's the, the kid up the street, then that's my platform, because I had a 3.8 GPA, okay, two basketball scholarships, Okay, so at that time, at 17 years old, before I made that decision to be the driver of the car of these armed robberies, Ooh. I wasn't classified as an at-risk teen. So because I wasn't classified as an at-risk teen, um, unfortunately, nobody came and told me about, as far as decisions to, to go ahead to prison or life after prison and so forth and so forth. So. I try to talk to every team. There's not there's not a specific group or oh the bad kids or the ones that already went to, to juvenile or the ones that you know oh you don't need to talk to the ones that are doing pretty good and got scholarships. No, I talk to every child because everybody's at risk to me. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? Right. And it, it just takes one time. Just because your your past doesn't depict that you're going to go to prison doesn't mean you might be in a car with somebody that you didn't know, and then all of a sudden you find yourself in the same situation that I found myself in. Mm -hmm. So I've spoken at various schools um, thus far and camps. Um, just recently I spoke at TLC's uh, Chili's Camp with the girls, and basically that was um, geared towards self-esteem and team building, and, different, and that was really exciting. Oh, I was so excited about that opportunity. Mm -hmm. And also um, I speak at various camps, and right now I'm in motion with teaming up with other organizations to conduct a 10-city prison prevention tour. And I'm very excited about that because I'm just trying to reach as many teens as possible as I can and, and make a difference. You know, I messed up my, my decisions um, and messed up, you know, my future. And hopefully I can inspire another team to be great and take advantage of the opportunities 
And then that way, you know, it will prevent as many teens from experience what I experience, you know? Right, right. And, and it sounds very inspirational. Now, you know what some people may say is like, well, while you were doing all this stuff, like, where were your parents? Yeah, I mean, I get that. I don't get it a lot, but I do get that. My parents are, were very involved in my life. Mm -hmm. um, I can't say that, though they were divorced. Um, I never seen my parents argue a day. I mean, till this day. Not saying that they never argue, right? You, but they respect me, and my, I have a younger brother. They respect me and my younger brother enough to not do it in front of us. However, my mom had a lot on her plate. You know, trying to um, get through a divorce. I'm not sure why they got divorced and all that. I leave that to them. Um, and trying to take care of two kids, you know, on her own, and still trying to maintain. Um, a comfortable lifestyle for us, and then at the same time being mom and the dad and, you know, providing financially for us and everything. So she had a lot of hats on, mm -hmm. and it was at times where during high school I wanted to talk to my mom as a friend. Before all this happened, it wasn't like I just one day woke up and said, hey, I wanted to commit our robbery. <laughs> it started off with, you know, given school because I just wanted to be accepted by my friends. Yeah. You know, yeah. um, smoke a little joint here and there just to see what it what it's all about because I've seen it on a rap video or, or, or on a movie that I saw. Um, but with, with my mom, she did play as the part. She kept me in church. She kept me on a straight and narrow. She was very strict. She didn't play that, you know. Mm -hmm. When I was out committing the crimes, I was more afraid of, disappointing her and getting caught by her than actually getting caught by the police. I mean, it's crazy to say, but my mom did not play that. Okay? I hear, yeah, I hear you because so, mine were um, like that. But the thing that I do, I just don't talk to, to, to the teens, too. I talk to the parents as well because I feel if maybe, you know, why did I have to wait? Why did me and my mom, it's not just on her, but why did both of us have to wait to want to talk to each other? Why did we have to wait till something bad happened to want to talk to each other? Right. Do you see what I'm saying? Right, right. And it's like she always said, I'm the parent, I'm not your friend. I'm the parent, I'm not your friend. So I, as a kid, I'm like, okay, well, she's not my friend. So I went to my friends for advice that knew nothing about nothing. And right. because of their advice, they told me, oh, yeah, be the ride or die chick. Yeah, you need to throw that boyfriend. Yeah, he needs 24-inch rims. Yeah, he needs to buy you, get your nails done. Yeah, he needs to buy you clothes. So, yeah, he needs to do this and do that, so forth and so forth. But I didn't feel like I can come to my mom as a friend and even talk to her about those things. Mm -hmm. So I tell the parents, like, look, you know, be the parent first. Don't get me wrong. You know, it needs to be boundaries. It needs to be rules. It needs to be regulations. However, be their friend second. Because you much rather your child to come to your advice than go to their friends. Yeah. You know, and and now as an adult, I understand where my mom was coming from. Mm -hmm. You know, now I understand. You know, she was just trying to prevent me from experiencing that. She was trying to do the best that she could, could she could from being, you know, um, her child going through the um, the prison system. Um, you know, now I understand. But thinking as a teen, we got to go back and think like them. You know, at right. one point in time, we were teens, too, and we thought we were grown. Exactly. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> you can't tell us nothing. We know everything. Yeah, you know, and I'm quite trying to say stuff. We're telling our kids is what our parents told us. You know what I mean? But did it work? Right, you know? right. So maybe we, if we try to go a different tactic, they're like, look, I'm your mom, and you're going to respect me as such. And I do respect you, Mom. However, before this teen pregnancy, let me show. Let me take you to the hospital and show you people who all these different diseases that you don't hear about mm -hmm. before you get on drugs. Let me let me take you to uh, let me take you to the rehab center. You know, like if you know, kind of like cause and effect. Well, if you try this drug, you know, ninety nine nine percent, this is how you're gonna turn out. Mm -hmm. So let me take you here and kind of shock you a little bit, show you this is what your life is gonna be. So, but if you want your life to be like this. Then by all means, go ahead and start preparing yourself for prison. Just prepare yourself, get your friends in line, or who's going to send you one on your book. Right, right. But I, you know, so, and I think that'll be a shock value, you know what I mean? Yeah. So we just go a different way, and then hopefully we can save as many, or not just save, I don't want to say that, let's, let's say inspire. Mm -hmm. Inspire our kids to be great, because a lot of times the school system, Lisa, the school system 
I have nothing against that. My daughter goes, she's in a public school system right now. However, I think they're raising our kids to be consumers. Yeah. I mean, didn't we watch that one time event stuff? Didn't we invent the light bulb? Like, <laughs> didn't we invent, and, you know, didn't we invent things, like, and create things? Yeah. The peanut, peanut butter, soybean, everything. But now, oh, are we just raised, are we just raised and branded to be consumers and buying Jordans and Jays and T-shirts and yeah. Gucci and Versace? Yeah. Are we, are we doing that? No. Our, your child is my child, okay? Let's get back to the village effect. That's what Let's we need. Let's about our kids. Yeah, and start inspiring our kids to be great and let them know we're great. Everything was created from a straw paper to a, a Ziploc bag to a paper bag. No, everything was created. I mean, if we told Moses in the Bible about touch phones, he'll, we'll be burnt and say we were rip witches or they'll say we're crazy. <laughs> You know what I mean? A yeah. Touch phone. People you go to Abraham and be like, "Yo, I got a touch phone. I'm gonna create a touch phone." That's crazy. <laughs> Everything starts with the way we're thinking, you know. And we need to inspire our kids to start changing their perception mm-hmm. of what reality is. Changing their perception on you can think outside of social studies. Right. Right. Well, you know, the thing, a lot of that starts at home, and if you, if there's nobody at home to help them inspire, like you say, you, they do tend to go to their friends, and the friends don't know. They just know what they know, and then the next thing you know, everybody's in trouble. Yeah, you're absolutely right about that, Lisa. But then I say, okay, what, what, what do we say to the parents that they don't know? You mm. see what I'm saying? Right, like, right. they don't know, and then he's, okay, so if that's the case, then, okay, well, we're not going to blame the parents that they don't know and they're teaching their kids this this stuff. So what I'm going to do is, instead of talking about that parent and seeing what they don't know, instead of talking about that kid and saying what they don't know and not care because it's not my kid, I'm going to take that kid in. I mean, that's what I do in my neighborhood. There's mm-hmm. two kids that come and tutor my daughter mm-hmm. every Tuesday and Thursday. And I tell them, I say, hey, look, you know, you can start your own business. One's in sixth grade, one's in seventh grade. I mean, start them young. I said, you know, you can start your own business. I need you to come tutor my daughter. My daughter is seven years old. She right. just turned seven on Friday. And they like, oh, really? I said, yeah, I'm going to give y'all $10. I'm going to give y'all $10 for one hour. So I call for $10 for each of them for one hour. You know that little boy made $150 off of me during the summer? <laughs> and, but you know what he told me? He said he's saving this money. I said, what you saving it for? He said, because I want my own tutoring, um, my own tutoring business for kids. Oh, no. I make my own tutoring business for kids. Yeah. And the other girl said, yeah, I'll work for you. I said, well, my daughter will be your first reference. Well, there you, you know, go. And there's no telling that little bit, that little bit of money that this little boy saved on what he can be. He might not have no tutoring business. Right. But who knows what comes out of that. And we yeah. need to start planting seeds. Yeah, that's why seeds. we have kids in our neighborhood like that. They're young mm-hmm. teenagers, and we always trying to tutor them to go the right thing, get them. And, you know, they said, well, we want to be uh, uh, state troopers. And then we look up and they're doing crazy stuff. I get on them all the time. I'm like, what is wrong with you? I said, do you know if you get a felony, you're not going to be a state trooper? And and so now when they see me, they're like, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. And it's like, I feel that they hear me, but they have peer pressure that's pushing them in another direction. Mm-hmm. But know, know this, Lisa. Know this. Those seeds that you planted, they are deeply rooted. Because please believe somebody told me that there was no pity in the naked city, okay? <laughs> and when I, got it, when I got in trouble, all of that stuff started coming back. Mm-hmm. Leave that boy alone. Um, you're, you're better. You're great. You know, all that stuff started coming back. So right. I'm just glad that even though I messed up, okay, mm-hmm. and those seeds that there were planted before I got in trouble, those people, those ad- they're adults now. But now they look at me and say, wow, Desiree. And what I say is, I'm so glad that you guys, you know, are not just alive, but you're able to see your, the seeds that you planted mm-hmm. come to harvest. Right, right. And that's what I'm I hope. i that you're able to see those seeds that you planted come to harvest. Mm-hmm. And, 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 you know, so don't, you know, even though, you know, kids are going to be kids, and we all was that at one point in time. And you know what we was thinking, girl. Right, you know, I don't right. I want to go back to that, but, <laughs> you know. Well, you know, my thing is. Uh, That's it. My thing is when, you know, I hope that by the time that the kids get a little bit older, they'll realize that Miss Quay meant well. And what I see happening is sometime they'll walk by and if I if they speak and I don't speak, they'll say, are you mad at me? What I do? What I do? (laughs) 
<laughs> and then I'll tell them what I, I'll tell them. I heard that you've been in trouble again. I heard you did so and so. No, ma'am, no, ma'am, no, ma'am. I'm like, okay, well, you know, whatever you do, I'm going to find out about it. And then I just leave uh -huh. it at that. So I'm hoping that fussing or whatever they want to call it sticks in their mind so that if they do become state troopers, I can at least say, well, good. One person kind of listened to me. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I'm so glad. I'm so glad that that's what you're doing because that's what it takes. That's what it takes because eventually, just think about it. If you just talk to 10 kids and then 10 of those kids talk to 10 kids and then those 10 of those kids talk to you, you know what I'm saying? Right, and right. have a ripple effect. And we might not see it today. Right. We might not see it tomorrow. My story, I mean, I might be talking to a kid that ain't doing nothing bad. Mm -hmm. Nothing. Right. It might not apply to them then. But as long as that seed is planted, if they do find themselves in that situation, they know how to get out of it. Right. They know what to, you know, they know what direction to go and make those decisions to not go down that road. Mm -hmm. And and that's what you instilled in them. And I'm just so glad. And hopefully, just hopefully, I mean, I'm not saying I'm going to change the world, but I guarantee you I'm going to spark the mind who does. Right. And that's my goal. And I always say, you know, <laughs> it's like you can't save them all, but you might be able to save one or two. And then I tell them all to think about consequences before you do something because mm -hmm. all actions mm -hmm. have consequences. And now if you mm -hmm. want to spend time in jail or if you want to get your record messed up and, and you young. So if you get a felony now when you're 16, I said, you're going to have trouble getting a job. You know, I said, so you got to think of that kind of stuff. You got to quit hanging with your crazy friends that are known to do bad stuff just because it seems like it's action. And it's like, no, you, are so right. you don't want to do that. So, so, right. mm -hmm. so I it's just. It's not just a job, though. Mm -hmm. and that's what I'm trying to tell them. It's not just a job that you'll lose out on. Yeah. Get your education, because now I can't go to school because I can't get financial aid because they do criminal background checks. Oh. I can't get an apartment because they do criminal background checks. I can't be a hairstylist because they do crack, um, background checks. I can't even be a nurse if I wanted to. Oh, because my. Because when they do the test, they do background checks. I can't be a lawyer because when you go to the board, they do background checks. I can't do a lot of things. I can't be a firefighter because guess what? They do background checks. Oh. I cannot. I mean, I can go down the list. I've tried it all for yeah. six years. Mm -hmm. I tried. I heard so many notes that I tried it all. And guess what? I can't even work in an office as no secretary because not only do they do background checks, they do credit checks. Yeah. So it's like, <laughs> you know. They have you coming and going. You know, like, that's why I say when you're okay. young and you're doing stupid stuff, this stuff <laughs> hangs, it hangs around with you. It's not like exactly, it's just going to fall off. Exactly. So it's not just jobs, but it's every little thing. So if you can't do that, then what makes you think, you know, what are your chances to, to survive? And right. What are your chances to have a better future, to inspire the world? Mm -hmm. So it's like, and, and, you know, you do get second chances, but you know what? Warning comes before destruction, Lisa. Right. Warning comes before destruction. And I might just be these kids' last warning. Right. So they can they can act up if they want to, but at least they know through my story how, how exactly how their life is going to end up. Because I didn't think that my seed or my decision that I made ten years ago would affect my life today. Yeah. And tomorrow. Well, and I 10 think years from now. Yeah, that's know? what I think. They don't think that far ahead because it's just like we were sitting outside. You know how all the kids walk in the street these days. So mm -hmm. the, the, where I live, the, the people fly up and down my street. I mean, it's 25, but everybody does at least 50. So the kids are walking down the street, and I roll up on them, and I said, why y'all walking in the street when we have sidewalks? I said, don't you know that you could get run over? And the first thing the little boy says, I'll sue him. I said, how are you going to sue him if you're dead? He goes, oh, well, if I don't die, I'll sue him. I said, wouldn't it be easy if you just walked on the sidewalk? I said, remember, four streets over in that subdivision, they don't even have sidewalks. And they want sidewalks. And you guys are playing in the street, playing Russian roulette with your life, and you know how fast people drive through here. He got up on the sidewalk. So I was so happy. Because <laughs> I okay. told him, I said, I don't want to see you splattered out here in the street because you will become a bumper sticker. That they just thought that was hilarious. And I'm just thinking, why do people do stuff like that? Why do you walk in the street? Why do they do that? I don't know. <laughs> I know. It's one of them things. It's like, hmm. You know how Arsenio used to say it's one of those things that make you go, hmm. Well, you know, I, I think I could kind of relate to them. 
um, when when we when we talk about uh, as far as living now for the moment because I mean a lot of TV a lot of movies a lot of radio uh, a lot of music plays a part on our kids are, are very impressionable I should say right very impressionable on um, a, a teenager or a young adult um, a perception of what reality is mm-hmm. and um reality uh at that age is like you know yolo you only live one only live one so if today is the day i'm going to live it to the fullest but we don't realize that those decisions that we made today do apply to to our tomorrow to our years ahead of us etc and you know i mean when i was in 16 years old when the when 2000 hit and i remember them saying Oh, the new millennium is the world. Yeah. So <laughs> I was like, okay, well, I'm going to live it up. I'm going to die anyway. The right. world is going to end. So I'm going to live my life to the fullest. And damn near to 13 years later, I'm still here. Right. And everybody. You know Everybody was going crazy because they was like stocking up stuff and we got to build yeah, shelters. Yeah. I remember it. The, the computers exactly. are going to crash yeah. and the world is coming to an end. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Oh, my um, goodness. I can kind of understand where that's coming from. Mm-hmm. But if we realize that, you know, if we just, I think it's still in our kids um, a, a different perception than what, what they perceive to be. Uh, the reality is start planting them seeds as entrepreneurs, right. as creators, as innovators, as chemical engineers, as so many different outlooks as, you know, in the Olympics. You know, don't just be playing basketball to be playing basketball. Mm-hmm. You know, we mm-hmm. for the Olympics. Right. You know what I mean? Right, like, right. If that's what you're going to do. Let's, let's go all the way out. Well, you know? other than and just then, um, doing it for the money. Know. Yeah, other than just mm-hmm. doing it for the money. Like every, when everybody mm-hmm. want to be a rapper these days. It's like, no, everybody can't rap. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> they see that exactly. quick money. Yeah, they see the quick money. That's all they think about. Now I want to rap. It's easy. That's not easy. Everybody can't mm-hmm. do it. Everybody that tries to rap is not successful. Yeah, and you're right. So it's like, okay, well, if you want to be a rapper... And, okay, well, once you have your own um, production, once you go to school for marketing, right? once you go to school for, you know, this, that, the other, and have different things that are wrapped around it, you know, you're you're very smart, you're computer savvy, they're great with the technology, once you create an app, once you create an app <laughs> that, that makes, that turns me into a rapper, right, you right, know, right. that right. say, hey, what's up, and then it turns me into a rapper or something. Once you create that app and make millions of dollars. Exactly. I mean, there's, a, there's young, young kids that are in the forest list that mm-hmm. are billionaires. There's nothing different. That's what I want them to know. It's nothing different from me and Oprah Winfrey. Right. She got two legs like I do. She got <laughs> one heart like I do. One brain like I do. Two arms. You just... There's nothing different from me than Steve Jobs. It's just that he's a male and I'm a female. Right. You see what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. The only difference is is that we have dreams, and we reach high, right? Right. The only diff- what makes them so different is that when they went through their adversity or somebody told them that it was crazy or somebody told them that it wouldn't work, guess what they did? They didn't give up. Mm-hmm. They didn't give up. And that's, what, that's the difference of, of being successful. That's the difference. Eighty-five percent. A millionaires are self-made. Eighty-five mm-hmm. percent of millionaires are self-made, and eighty-five percent of them came from hard, tough upbringing, childhood environment. Uh, 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 the lack, sleeping on floors. They just had an idea. Yeah. You know what made that idea come alive? Because they didn't give up. They mm-hmm. didn't give up. They didn't give up, and that's what I want to let our kids know. Like, look, you are really great. Be mindful of your I am. Be mindful of the words that you. Mm-hmm. But words are vibrations. Vibrations are energy, and energy is power. Right. So if your words are vibrating, that's why we have different sounds, why people sound differently, because it's a different vibration. I mean, think about it. When people smoke, they got that little um, plastic thing in their throat, and, and the only way you can understand them when talking is because their voice, the sound is, is echoing off of the vibration. Mm-hmm. So if vibration scientifically says vibrations are it's just energy bouncing off of stuff, mm. well, if that's the case, 
space and energy is power, then we need to be mindful of how we speak to our kids. Right, we right. We need to be mindful of how our kids speak to themselves. We need to be mindful of, of our future. And I bet you, Lisa, man, we got, I mean, it's, it's time. It's that time. It's that time. The time is now. The time is now. So let them know, like, okay, well, yeah, I mean, don't we, we, we can't crush your dreams because the school is already doing that enough. Mm-hmm. The school is already doing that enough and not inspiring them to be greater than outside of that. Right, that's the you thing. Know what I mean? Some of the school systems are just in bad shape, and the teachers are wore down, beat down. And now it yeah. just it gets to be just a matter of they're getting paid to live their life, and you know the kids are suffering. And it's not all of them, but uh, Flint schools, uh, you know, we're having a lot of trouble here. And I know like Saginaw, Detroit, different areas that are having a lot of problems with the school system. And we'll, I don't know if it's the government or, you know, I don't know what it is, but it just seems sad that a lot of the kids that really want a good education can't get it because of funding and different things like that. <clears throat> well, how about, See what what uh, another thing is is uh, I, I don't want to focus too much on the problem. We already know what the problem is. Mm-hmm. It's been the same problem when I was in school. You see what I'm saying? It was the same problem when my parents were in school. Let's focus on how we can bring a solution. Okay, so the teachers are getting ran down. Let's let's get some parents involved. Right. I, I know I volunteer an hour to read to the class to give the teacher a break. To right. Give her an hour break to mm-hmm. eat her lunch to go outside and get some fresh air, to get a break. Can you imagine uh, taking care of or teaching six- and five-year-olds, 25, five- and six-year-olds? Right. And trying to get their attention? That's hard work. It's hard for me <laughs> to just get one. I know. You know what I mean? <laughs> so I, I volunteer one hour. Let's volunteer. Let's get back into the schools. Let's, you remember that movie, Lean On Me? Yes, yes. Let's get back to that. That's... Let's get back to the parents. <laughs> Coming in and just counseling. Mm-hmm. Let's get back to the parents. Yo, you know, at least, you know, give the teacher an hour break this time. You know, let's relieve them and not get paid for it. Mm-hmm. Let's care about that. You know, if it's only a dollar, let's start joining the PTA. Right. Let's, let's start, you know, get collecting just a dollar or 15 cents. You know, a dollar for a whole year, a day, a dollar a day of the whole year is $365 for a whole year. How many books can we buy with that? Yeah. That's one of the main problems, too, is they don't have supplies anymore, and and a lot of parents are, uh, don't have time to be involved because a lot of them are not stay-home parents like they used to be when I was growing up. And so, you know, they do need to help. The teachers need aids in the classroom because the classrooms are bigger than they used to be, and I can see that driving people crazy. Oh, yeah, definitely. I could imagine, but... For the, the for the I mean I'm a single mom too, mm-hmm. but for the single mom that's going to work, want you know your hour lunch that you take, right? Okay, once you eat your lunch on the way to the school and volunteer that one hour, uh huh. Why not? Why not? It's just one day out of your regular routine. Yeah, yeah. If someone came up with a system like that where parents would be willing to do that, I think the teachers would get more rest. I think the students would get used to having somebody else there. Because sometimes I think they just, the kids, you know, they know they can just drive the teacher crazy. <laughs> so I think they oh, wake yeah. up. They, oh, yeah. yeah they, I can imagine. They wake up in the morning and say, oh, yeah, I'm going to get her today. <laughs> oh, yeah. They already got their plan and everything set out. But you know what? It's like this. Like, you know. What my my child, you know, I'm not. Her dad is in her life. Mm-hmm. There's this one. There's this one. Um, there's a few dads in her classroom. Um, you know that come with a two family home, and they come in there, but they inspire her, and it's like, you know, they talk to her and all the other students too as well. But I'm just glad that I can have the community that they care about enough about my daughter as much as I care about mine. So now that might not be her dad. And, but they can inspire her and influence her, and she got a male figure that right. comes and says, you know what, Simone, you're smart. You know that? Mm-hmm. You know how smart you are? You know at six years old what that does to kids? Right. You know, you don't know what kids go on in their families or at home. And just to bring a popsicle. I'm quite sure there's some people that get food stamps or whatever. Okay, buy some popsicles for the kids. Mm-hmm. Okay, if y'all do good this weekend, I mean this week, if y'all do good this week, I'm going to bring some popsicles for y'all Friday. Right. I mean, you know, donate that. You know, do what you can with what you have until you can do better. And that's what I'm doing. Um, this October we have a prison prevention tour 
um, going on, and I would love to come to um, Flint, Michigan. I would love, 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 love come to Flint, Michigan. Mm-hmm. We've got some exciting things going on. We teamed up with Story Court here in Atlanta, Georgia, and what we're doing is just sharing as many stories as we can to inspire our teams to make a difference mm-hmm. and, to, and to do their best. And we and we have ten cities locked down. Um, of course, the tour the tour dates are going to be up soon on my Facebook on my website. They can visit me at uh, I am Desiree Lee dot com and get those dates too as well. Mm-hmm. Um, we teamed up with um, Red Roof Inn and different corporations that are helping sponsoring this tour, so I'm very excited for people who want to volunteer um, and give their time. Uh, they're more than welcome because the more help help we can get and the more funds and donations that we can receive, the more children that we can help at, at one time and be consistent with this. So I'm excited. Yeah. I'm so excited. It would be nice to have you come up here because there's a lot of kids up here that I consider at risk because there's so, much, so many kids that don't mind shooting each other. And that's one thing that bothers me is how they have so little thought about life and it's just like they need somebody to come in and you know like and some of them probably would be really excited about having a woman come in and tell them about being in prison versus a man because they seem like you know women that's ah that's kind of frou-frou but you know if they had a, a woman come in and tell them what it's like I think so, you probably get some attention they get their attention oh okay that's great that's great just let me know uh, well, Jason, we can definitely go from there because I feel as though, like, Lisa, I thought it would never happen to me. Mm-hmm. I thought going to jail, prison, all that was far from anywhere from my future. Right, or From right. my life. Right. And just like, you know, they're these sensitive, you know, I'm not saying they're not sensitive, mm-hmm. but, I mean, it's normal. I mean, what do you, what, what do we as a community expect when that's normal? Right. The thing is, is that I don't go in with a scare straight approach. I'm not going in there with no belt and whooping no kids and, <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. And giving them the, the straight. Mm-hmm. I'm just like, look, this is what I did. This is how it happened. This is what I did to get in this situation. This is how my life is today. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. If this is how you want your life to look, then go ahead and continue doing what you're doing. Cause- However, because bottom line, You know, you're going to do what you want to do regardless of what I say. Right. However, if you make this a mistake, this is how your life is going to be. So Mm -hmm. if this is what you want for your life, then you mean you only can help those that want to be helped. Right, and there's no turning back. Yeah. Absolutely. So it's like, you know, but I don't want it. So this is what you do to not find yourself in the situation. If you find yourself in a situation, this is what you do to, to, to get out. Talk to somebody because... Like I told you before, I was more afraid to go home than uh, than facing the police. Mm-hmm. I was in a situation and didn't know how to get out of it. Right. So that's why we were robbing for two weeks every day. Oh. 14 days, all day, every day. Dang. For two weeks. Yes. <laughs> you I were just... just. I didn't know how to go home. I didn't know how to stop. I you... didn't know how to go home. <laughs> I didn't know how to talk to my mom because she was my parent. Mm-hmm. I couldn't talk to my mom about something like that. Wow. You know? So, and it's just trying to, all from just trying to fit in. So, it's like, you know, it's okay to be yourself. Mm-hmm. It's okay to be yourself. It's okay to be the best that you can be. It's okay, you know. Ain't nothing wrong with that. But, you know, just make better decisions. And I'm just so glad that God, I'm just that I'm allowing God and I'm um, to use me to be his vessel for his children because I do not know whose life might be depending on my story. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I tell this to a, a lot of people, you know, when I was in my dark place, and right. I, I got tired of hearing all the no's from being a convicted felon, and I got tired of hearing all the what you can't do, and nobody's giving me no options, nobody's telling me the how to, everybody's telling me what to do, but they're not telling me the steps on how to do it, mm-hmm. and prison was so cruel, and so nasty, and so... I mean, it's so many different things that I refuse to go back to that place. Okay, oh. the statistics shows that within a, well, as soon as you get out, within three years, you'll be right back in. You'll go right back to prison. That's what the statistics show. Wow. And that's 89% of inmates will go back within the first three years. Well, I'm so happy to say that I've been out of prison for going on seven years um, this year. But what, what I'm saying is, is that, you know, it, it, 
it's it's that time that we that we get back not just to get back to our our teams but to let them know like straight up like look this is how it is mm-hmm. I'm not here to scare y'all I'm not here to tell you what and what not you know or what you can to be your boss and try to be your mama mm-hmm. I'm not trying to do that either right. what I'm trying to let y'all know is what real life is mm-hmm. and I take my life seriously right so when I talk to you guys I take it seriously mm-hmm. because you're you're my child you are me. You or me. And if I was you, if I was 17 all over again, I would want somebody to take my 17-year-old life seriously. Mm-hmm. Take my life as seriously as you take your own. And that's why I talk to these kids, because I take it seriously. Right. I take their years and their teenagers seriously. Just like it's, if it was my life and I was standing in their shoes as of today. Mm-hmm. It's hard. Right. I can only imagine what those kids are really going through, the adversities that they're really going through. And it's like, you know, now we need to start giving them some answers. We right. need to start giving them some answers. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And start telling them what's bad and, and, and what they're not doing or what they should do. No, give them some answers. Maybe they don't know how. Right, right. Maybe they don't know how, you know. Mm-hmm. Maybe they don't know how. And, we, and once we do that, because that's what I was upset about, too. You know, everybody used to say I had a bad attitude in high school. Oh, you got a nasty attitude. You got a nasty attitude. And I'm like, okay. And nobody told me how to change my attitude, but yet they said I needed to change it. Right. But nobody took the time to tell me how to change it. So I'm like, well, evidently, okay, you know I got a nasty attitude. I know I got a nasty attitude. Is somebody going to help us sister out and tell me how to change this thing? <laughs> or is everybody going to keep telling me how nasty my attitude is? Right, right. And I think that's what the kids are now. They're mm-hmm. like, okay, I know. Mm-hmm. I know that's wrong. I know that's that. I know that's that. But ain't nobody taking the time out to tell me how. Ain't nobody telling me how to change nothing. Ain't nobody telling me the steps to take. Ain't nobody holding my hand. Right. Ain't nobody showing me that. Evidently, I don't know how if I keep doing the same thing over and over again. Mm-hmm. So that's what we need to get at, girl. I'm yeah. sorry. I don't want to talk, talk <laughs> to you know, uh, but Well, you know, like I'm I say. I'm really, really passionate about it. And I really, I'm, I take it personally. Right, you know? right, right. <laughs> well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to really uh, see if I can work on getting you you come into Flint sometime next year and I I'm that's the, I, that's inspired me because we do need to help here and I'm going to talk to some people and see if we can actually get you here one one day next year you know we'll bring you here when it's not so hot <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Well, I want to thank you for taking the time to talk to me because it was very inspirational. And um, I hope when people do listen to the show that they can get a little inspired about it and your motivation. And you motivated me to want to bring you here. So maybe you motivate some people that actually want to do the right thing. And some people may be able to contact you and, you know, talk to you on a one on one, you know, whatever it takes. You know, we want to keep motivating the youth to do the right thing. So I want to thank Absolutely. you. So I, would... I really appreciate appreciate you inviting me on your show. I really appreciate this opportunity because, you know, to be able to, on this platform to be able to share my story and to be able to inspire. And it's not just, you know, teens. I just want everybody to know, like, if, if you feel like you're in this place where you have no options and there's no way out, my story, you know, my testimony it's a prime example of there are options and there is a way out and it will be okay and you will make it out and you just have to persevere and you just can't give up. If you want to be successful, you can't give up. So that's what you got to do. Mm-hmm. You got to do the best you can with what you have until you can do better. Right. And that's right. it. And, that's and allow it. God to be who he is and, and work it out for you. You sit back and be still and watch God's glory be done. You, you sit back and you watch him do and work it all out. You just do the best you can with what you have until you can do better. And then you'll start seeing your prayers and those seeds that you planted harvest. And just to be encouraged. And, you know, you can always reach me at on my website. It's um, IamDesireeLee.com. Uh, or you can always also reach me on uh, Facebook at uh, D. Lee Inspires. You can always reach me on there, Facebook or Twitter or Instagram. Um, on D. Lee Aspires, and I'll be more than happy to come to your city or to your town or organization or school to be able to share my story and inspire as many kids as possible. Thank you so much, Lisa, for this opportunity. I appreciate it. Thank you. All right, girl. Well, you have a good one, and enjoy the rest of your day. Okay. Talk to you soon. All right. Okay. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye-bye. 
So that was Miss Desiree Lee called in from Atlanta. So I want everybody to um, go to her Facebook page and website and check out all the great stuff that she's doing and has done. And like she said, maybe you want to invite her to come to your city and speak and everything. And I would really love to have her come to Flint. So maybe we can get some sponsors and everything to uh, bring her here. So anyways, next week, why don't you make sure you tune in and be after Labor Day so everybody have a safe Labor Day uh, Monday and that weekend because I don't want everybody to not be here for next Tuesday show. Right, John? Right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we will talk to everybody Tuesday the 3rd. Uh, my guest will be Daniel P. from Color Vibe 5K Run. I think that's what it is. Uh, he'll be calling in. So until then, Flaming Pit, and we're out.